Okay, so broadly speaking here, there are three, let's say, overarching goals that you might have if you are communicating about uh, harms and benefits. And that would be true to politicians and policymakers or to the general public. You might want to share information, uh, change someone's beliefs, or change their behaviors. And uh, the key here to recognize is that the kinds of messages that are most effective for one or other of these goals are not equally effective for all goals. So the first decision is to uh, explicitly say, well, what is, the, what is the goal here? Are we trying to change people's behaviors or have them understand something differently or just give them information and allow them to uh, use their own values and judgment about whether they want to change anything? This is this one, the share information one. I think many communicators think they're doing this, but what they actually are, when you ask them, you know, how are you going to measure success? And they say, oh, well, we'll see if people's behavior has changed. Then they're really not actually trying primarily just to inform people. There's some good background on this, and, and we especially like um, a philosopher named Honora O'Neill, who has said that um, when communications are designed to inform, to help people make decisions, two really key components are that the messages be useful, they have the right information uh, communicated in a way that people can understand it, and that they be trustworthy in the sense that they represent harms and benefits appropriately uh, and accurately. So that's, that's a bit of the misinformation bit there accurately, and we can look at what that looks like when you get it wrong. So here's an O'Neill, and she says, trustworthiness uh, should be based on competence. The reason she says trust, trustworthiness instead of trust is that a lot of these organizations, they say, well, our goal is that uh, people trust us more, and then they will change their behavior, or change their beliefs. But uh, O'Neill says we shouldn't aim that people trust us more. We should instead think about what is the way in which we can communicate that is the most trustworthy. That is, that represents the information in the most balanced, fair, competent, accessible way. And if you focus on trustworthiness, then trust as a product will follow, but it was never the point. So uh, for, as an example here, here's a graph. It says, how concerned are you about the Zika virus? And you have these size of these bar charts, and then you have numbers above them. It's not even clear how they could have made this mistake. I mean, it, it's so bad, uh, really bad. So this is an example of doing it incompetently. It's not accurate. Another thing that she said is that it shouldn't be dishonest. So the mistake we just saw probably was accidental. But take a look at this one. We have uh, uh, Obamacare enrollment as of two time periods and the scaling of the y-axis here Instead of showing the y-axis, I don't know, from zero to eight million, they're showing it from five and a half million to seven million, and it really accentuates the difference between these two numbers that are not terribly different. So this is, this is not incompetence, this is deliberate obfuscation, is my guess. And then she also highlighted that in addition to all the components we've talked about, you have to be doing this consistently over time, you have to be reliable. So, you know, let's say we, um, look at the news source and we complain to them, we have a public uh, journalistic conversation about accuracy and we go back and we see, well, how are they doing later? No, they do the same trick over and over again. Okay, so that's not reliable. You may remember O'Neill said, well, we need the right information. What is the right information? Well, uh, we always advocate doing elicitation work you have to ask your audience questions. You can't just assume you know what's best for them and what they want in every way. So you get to know the audience, identify the groups, sample them, qualitative and uh, quantitative kinds of surveys. And you find out what their goals are, what's relevant to them, and what their capabilities are, their, their numeracy, their graph literacy, their ability to process what kinds of information. And you can use that to craft the most effective messages for informing them. Here's an example of a communication. It says, uh, calls for ibuprofen sales, ibuprofen sale restrictions after a study finds cardiac arrest risk 
Okay, so let's see what the risk is. They say this over-the-counter drug is linked to 31% increased risk with the figure rising to 50% for a particular drug. That sounds pretty dangerous. But one of the key problems when risk is being communicated in public uh, is that these types of risks shown here, which are relative risks, uh, are often presented without the absolute risks, that is the base rate, how, how common this problem is in the population at all. And it can be really misleading if you obscure the base rate. This is because what is risk? Risk is really the likelihood of something bad happening and then how bad it will be. But both of these things can be filtered through a perceptual process. We're more scared of some risks than others. You know, we're more scared of shark attack than heart disease, even though the latter is orders and orders of magnitude more uh, dangerous to us. We're not, we're, we're more scared of coronavirus than of climate change, even though the latter is probably going to kill more people even fairly soon. So what we're using with the risk, risk communication is we're going to uh, help perception meet reality with regard to probability and severity. And the relative risks here are obscuring something important. They're obscuring that the cardiac arrest risk is really quite low. So overall chances of cardiac arrest in 30 days, the absolute risk is one in 10,000. And then if you have a 31% increase, well, then you get to 1.3 in 10,000. And if you tell people that, they perceive a different risk than they would if you didn't tell them that number. And it makes sense that newspapers get this wrong for a couple of reasons. The first is that just more information is not their preference. They want to keep things clean. Okay, just relative risk, boom. Simplicity is its own kind of master. Uh, another good reason is that newspapers are in the business of selling attention to their stories and engagement. And this story, 1.3 in 10,000, is just not as interesting. But it accurately represents the underlying base rates that people need to understand if they're gonna think about changing their own behaviors, should I take ibuprofen or not, or they're thinking about changing a government policy or voting for certain things. We recommend strongly always use the absolute risks, not just relative risks when talking about harms and benefits. Okay, so how would you do this? I just said do it, but uh, let's look at some different techniques. So which of these cancer death rates is higher? 1,286 out of uh, 10,000 or 24.14 out of 100? The quick point isn't which one of these is higher, but that this is difficult. This is difficult even for academics, and therefore we shouldn't expect the public to be very good at this. Compare with a different kind of arrangement with a visual aid. For example, which bowl of these would you like to choose from? On the left, you have 10 balls and one of them is a winner. Or on the right, you have 100 balls and seven of them are winners. Now we can sort of get a sense of the base rate. But even so, 53% pick from the less, uh, less likely bowl here. So they're still misunderstanding. And the overall point I would say is that when you change the base rate in a comparison, 10,000 to 100, or here 10 to 100. It's really hard to follow. So we also say, keep the denominator the same. Otherwise, it's very difficult for people to compare. Another thing we uh, investigate in risk communication is when and how much you can use words instead of numbers. So when we say that constipation is a common side effect, what do people think that means in terms of frequency or pancreatitis is rare? If you ask people, these kinds of uh, figures come up. They think that common is maybe one in three and rare is, I don't know, one in five, one in six, roughly, let's say. But the actual risk of these conditions as a side effect from statins is uh, off by another two to four orders of magnitude. So people uh, seem to be getting the dramatically wrong number from, um, from these words common and rare. In the US, you may remember that this came up as well. 
uh, in one of the Gulf Wars with the CIA saying, you know, weapons of mass destruction are likely or something. And then it came out later that that word was very misunderstood by the policymakers. So the point is, words like common or rare, you have to test what they mean to your population if you want to use them to communicate quantitative information. One of the best examples of this is the IPCC uh, panel on climate change. They did a lot of research to understand how their terms map on to different types of probabilities. And although there's still a discrepancy between the terms and the quantitative probability, there's not a lot. Like they've done a good job to make sure that the words are being understood more or less how they intend them. All right, let's look at another example. We have a uh, cardiac arrest resuscitation drug has brain damaged thousands. And then over here, giving adrenaline to people who have had cardiac arrest uh, barely increases their survival chances, but doubles the risk of brain damage. Is this an absolute risk or a relative risk? It's a relative risk, that's right, because you're just doubling from some number to some other number, X to 2X, but what X is matters. Here's another way to show it using what's called an icon array. An icon array helps people with uh, thinking about a proportion, you know, a numerator over a denominator. Here on the left, we have an icon array showing 250 people suffering cardiac arrest and not given adrenaline. And you see that there are six survivors, one with a special outcome. And over on the right, they're given adrenaline, and now we have eight survivors, two of them with that special outcome. Is that better? That's up for judgment, but it at least looks more comparable or even more promising compared to the last slide where we just said doubles your risk of brain damage. Yeah, but with what benefit? They didn't give, they didn't give the absolute and relative benefit and they didn't uh, show the underlying base rate. So really misleading, unfortunately, and uh, the icon array can help with that. Interestingly, um, when you, when you pilot test these kinds of materials, you also find out things that you would never have expected, or at least we, that we didn't. If you do this kind of icon array, but you include them as little stick figures, as people, and then you talk to, I don't know, people who are at great risk of heart disease about whether they understand and which format they prefer. We found out, for example, that people found the little images of people quite scary. Like it was too intimidating for them to think, am I this little red one that's dead? And so for that reason, some of the icon arrays use circles here or squares or something that's not quite so personal. And I think someone who works with, with numbers about death all day might forget that it's quite scary to people. So this is another reason why you have to test your materials. Okay, um, one of the things that we looked at a lot was um, uh, breast cancer, and this is, proportions of the population that misunderstand uh, the benefits of, of uh, mammography for improving breast cancer outcomes. So of course, mammography can detect some problems in advance and lead to treatment, but it can also detect things that aren't gonna be problems and lead to overtreatment, and it can fail to detect problems. And it turns out mammography is not nearly as effective at reducing death as people think. And so, all of these countries dramatically overestimate its effectiveness, uh, but some countries more than others. And if you see, Russia has the most accurate, most realistic impression. Why would that be? Well, it's probably because they, of all these countries, have had the least um, public health messages uh, about the effectiveness of mammography. Here's one from the US. It says, if you haven't had a mammogram, you need to have more than your breasts examined. That's, that's very strident, uh, even offensive. Yeah, and, and yet this is, this is a primary you know, communication from the American Cancer Society. Okay, it was from the 80s, but this kind of message, think back to the original um, framework. Was it, you know, are you trying to inform people? Are you trying to change their behavior? This doesn't inform someone. It just is sort of insulting and, and says, uh, you, you must do this. It doesn't say what your risks are. It doesn't say that mammography itself has risks as well. Okay, so what would a high quality message designed to inform look like? Before we get there, let's look at the actual data and just, uh, and just 
just to reinforce the story here in case you're not familiar with it, <clears throat> screening does reduce breast cancer mortality, but not much, not much. It goes from five to four per 1,000 women, 50 plus that are screened. So what would a high quality message look like? This is what the uh, UK came out with in 2013. And it's the whole pamphlet on the right, it says, uh, helping you decide. And then inside the pamphlet, it has images like the one at the above where a woman is sort of holding two options, this option or this option. And the pamphlet does not tell you to do it. It tells you, here are the harms and benefits, consider the offer. I, uh, we think this is really high quality. This is helping people understand the underlying evidence and make their own decision. And this is especially appropriate for a domain like breast cancer mammography, where the evidence isn't that overwhelming that it's worth doing. Okay, now back to Honora O'Neill. She also talked about things being reported accurately. And so let's talk about a little bit of a more subtle problem now, more than the uh, sort of obvious issues we saw earlier. This was a, this was a headline uh, in the UK a couple years ago. It said, UK unemployment falls to 1.44 million. Sounds good. And then if you look down at more detail and I've uh, zoomed in for you, it says fell by 3,000 to 1.44 million, blah, 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 blah. Already you should have alarm bells going off because 3,000 is a very different size number than uh, millions. And you might think, well, how do they even measure this? And how good is this measurement? It used to be that unemployment was counted directly, but it's not anymore. Um, and actually what they do is they do this through surveying. So they survey a number of people and they ask if they recently lost their job and they extrapolate to the whole population, which is fine. But if you do that, it depends on how many people you surveyed, how large your confidence intervals are. So digging into this took us some time. Um, but our supervisor, uh, you know, the chairman of the Winton Center, at the, uh, Sir uh, Professor David Spiegelhalter, is uh, well known in the UK for complaining to newspapers about uh, their coverage. And when we dug into this, he did complain and they did change it. And you'll see why. So the Office of National Statistics in the UK is great. They, they provide a lot of uh, clear data that can be used to, for digging around. Now, most people wouldn't want to go into these tables, but it is there, which is very helpful. And if you dig into the report that headline was based on, you go, okay, where, where am I? Oh, I see, okay, quality and methodology. Let's go down there. Eventually, you will find this sentence. It says, a small fall of 3,000 with a 95% confidence interval of plus or minus 77,000. <laughs> so what's really happened here is that the newspaper has written probably two versions of the headline, UK unemployment rises, UK unemployment falls. And then they check the number and they're like, all right, fell by 3,000, run the fall number. But they have missed the point, which is that we really don't know what it did. It might've gone up, it might've gone down, it might've stayed the same. The evidence cannot speak to a fall of 3,000. It's not a fall at all. So that was a inaccurate reporting on their, on their behalf. Okay. I've been sort of zooming around different products and I wanna show you the biggest thing that the Winton Center has done it's, since it's in medicine and you're a, a more biomedical group. This is the PREDICT uh, online tool and it was pre-tested extensively with both patients and uh, providers. And we needed to answer questions like, how do we present what kinds of evidence in a way that it can be understood by people of a lot of different capabilities about their risk of different uh, breast cancer outcomes and what kind of treatment they should select? So there's two stories here, really. One is there's an underlying statistical mathematical model, which uh, was built by a team of researchers using a large corpus of breast cancer data, you know, women with this kind of cancer, with these nodes in, um, you know, of, these, of this size, of this age, then go on to have these kinds of treatments and, and how did they, how did, was their survival affected? Uh, but then there's the whole side that the Winton Center really primarily worked on, which is how to display that information in a way that it could be understood. It's a substantial problem. And 
Here is an example. Let's say you enter a bunch of detail for uh, a certain kind of patient. Here's an example of the output you get from the predict model. It says, okay, uh, these type of women, um, 10 years after surgery, have this predicted benefit. You know, surgery only, 77% of them will be alive 10 years later. And then plus different kinds of additional therapies, increasing the survival rate. A lot of testing has to go into this because it's, there's a lot of opportunity for confusion. Another thing is that, is it best to present this information in tables? It turned out that certain of the audience preferred tables and certain preferred other kinds of charts. So we included all of them. You can see up at the top and you can click between them. So here's um, similar information. Uh, looks like the same data actually, uh, but now shown in a, a sort of a um, survival curve line chart um, where of course, Everyone is going to have decreasing survival over time, but then uh, it, with the additional treatments, you can get back up towards that higher line. So backing up a little bit, I at the Winton Center, I didn't work primarily on medical topics. My main focus was on policy option communication. So for example, when when a country can decide, are we going to do this? Or are we going to do that? Are we going to have Brexit? Are we going to do single payer healthcare? How do we communicate those complex topics to uh, individuals to help them decide what, um, which path to choose? And so this article is one of our most important papers. And it is a, a series of reviews, essentially, where we looked how are policy options being communicated right now by different groups and governments? What kind of advice is given to people designing those communications? And what evidence do we have that the different formats and types of content are effective at informing people? Uh, there's not a lot of guidance and there's not a lot of evidence for effectiveness. So the main thing here was collecting sort of a broad review of how are, how are policy options being communicated? And then we combine that into a synthesis and we, um, we showed that there are four key things that make it particularly difficult uh, for policy options and, and that you need to keep in mind when designing them. And these four are different effects on different subsections of the population. So for example, you might have a new tax policy and it has these effects on GDP and this and that and the other thing but it might have different effects on young people versus old people. And it's important to communicate those differences if, uh, if you want to be accurate and balanced in talking to those groups about what, the, what should serve their own personal interests. But when you start communicating harms and benefits, and then you start bridging them across different subgroups, it gets very complicated quickly, and that is a, a problem. Uh, similarly, different types of outcomes. You might not just care about GDP. You might care about, uh, I don't know, savings rates or um, any kinds of other outcomes, long time scales, large uncertainties, and all of these make it more difficult to present the information in a way that is both complete enough and can be understood. So that's what we write about in that paper. Feel free to check it out. It's open access. And I wanted to uh, now bridge into a, a section of the talk where we're going to talk about these uh, groups called the What Works Centers in the UK. And what they do is they, there's a bunch of them, there's 10 or so, and they present evidence about different interventions and uh, how effective those interventions are for some outcome, uh, what the quality is, that sort of thing. So this one is for crime reduction. So the, this is a toolkit that is used by people involved in crime reduction and in policing, but also by other groups and policymakers. And you can see here rows which show different interventions like alcohol ignition interlock, okay? And then you see columns talking about like how effective is it and uh, um, what's the quality of the evidence and that sort of thing. This isn't, um, this isn't our favorite one. I've shown it to you because just, to give you the sense of if you were to encounter a website, is it confusing? Do you realize what's going on? You know, you can see there's these little filled 
rectangles below each rating. And then you have to look over to the left. You say, oh, okay, this is how, what the evidence quality is for this impact. This is a bit confusing. So I think they're trying to express a lot of information, but probably some things are being lost along the way. What we did um, last year is ran a 20 minute survey of a bunch of users of these toolkits. So expert users, policymakers, practitioners that are um, trying to use this information and would be familiar with, its, uh, with it in general. And then we also um, did a, a sample, an online sample just of um, uh, normal people from the adult population in the UK. Fortunately for our results and for the story, they actually perceived very similar things. They wanted the same information, they had the same capabilities, and they uh, preferred the same types of uh, presentation formats. So we can combine most of that. This paper is under review, but you can see our uh, preprint if you want, it's online. And so, the, the first thing is there's lots of different kinds of information that you could present someone about an intervention, such as uh, information about what kinds of evidence is behind it and this and that and the other thing. The lower numbers here are, um, are meaning higher priority, closer to priority number one. And what you see is that two of these types uh, of evidence have the highest priority, effectiveness, does it work? And evidence quality, how good is our evidence? And then everything else is secondary. Okay, so that, that's a clear sign to policymakers then. Those are the two things that people wanna hear about. What we then did is we looked at the different types of icons that were being used across the different what work centers to communicate um, evidence uh, quality and, um, and effectiveness. And we thought, you know, some of these might be a little unclear. If you show them without any words, without any format, can people even tell what type of thing these icons refer to? So we took these icons and then we showed them a list of potential types of evidence. And we asked them to match the icons to the types of evidence. And then we can see which of these icons are best understood, you know, outside of the framework of the toolkit. And then uh, that should inform which ones we might pick. The, the first thing to report is that overall accuracy was pretty poor. Maybe that's because we gave them 12 options, but I think it's also fair to say this is worth testing. We want people to be able to understand these things. 50% is not great. So here's the results in order of the icons that were best uh, understood to mean effectiveness and that were intended to mean effectiveness. If you look down at the um, second to bottom one with the X's and X check marks, that's the crime reduction one we saw a few uh, turns ago. Didn't perform the best. And the best performing ones seem to have uh, some sort of filled and unfilled circles, maybe colored. You know, that was very, uh, it was more widely understood to mean how effective some intervention is. Now for evidence quality, people did not know what was going on, generally speaking, from the icon alone. In particular, the um, security padlock rating was misunderstood to, they, people thought it meant data security. And that makes sense because the padlock appears in other places online to mean security, like on online banking and that sort of thing. So perhaps it's not the best icon for quality of evidence. The, mic the microscopes you see perform quite well. In fact, that icon is not in current use at any of the centers. We, do, we worked with a designer um, during a workshop a while ago to create that. And then we, uh, we actually threw it into the study at the last minute. We thought, yeah, we might as well test the microscope. And it, it turned out it performed much better than any of the other um, icons for, for what people thought meant, you know, the quality of the scientific evidence. Out of this project, we, we really have a couple key pieces of advice. Test communications for objective comprehension, not just something like behavior change. You need to directly test whether they can be understood. Comprehension of different icons varied, and we recommend using ones with scale like that. 
and quality icons were poorly understood, but the microscope did fairly well. So that, that was our advice to the centers and they are rebuilding and um, moving forward with new designs as well. Um, I, I'll skip one and two here, but let's talk about number three. Users often said to us in that study that they want more detail. We would say, well, do you wanna see it for men and for women? Do you wanna see it for young people and old people? And they routinely, for almost all of those questions said, yes, we want more detail. But just a word of caution about that. That evidence, evidence for intervention effectiveness by subgroup mostly doesn't exist, so we can't present it. And those additional branching details are gonna make it harder for people to understand what's in the presentation. So it's not always better to present more information and it's also not always better to uh, accede to whatever requests people have for the communications. You have to find a compromise that works and then test it. The last section of the talk, I want to show you about a recent study that we've just had um, published and it was about how to present potential harms and benefits. And we're using this work to um, inform future studies as well. So it's a good place to round up. One of my collaborators here is Michelle McDowell at the Harding Center for Risk Literacy in Germany. It was surprising to us, the existing evidence for how to present potential harms and benefits for a decision is not very deep, even though this sounds like it would be a very important topic. We also need this kind of foundation that this study provides so that we can run policy studies, you know, not just the individual decisions, but then including those difficulties that the review article came up with, like the different effects on different subgroups. So that's the motivation for this line of work. And we did it in a registered report format at Royal Society Open Science. And what a registered report is, it's, it's a particularly rigorous, um, uh, sort of like a, a, a clinical trial where you say in advance exactly how you're going to measure everything and what stats you're going to use and that it's well powered and then you follow your own procedure very closely. So it, um, it, it removes some of the uh, p-hacking or uh, questionable research practices that are still typical across much of scientific literatures, including biomedical science. In this study, we just compared uh, presenting harms and benefits in a table versus text. And we wrote the table and the text to be as close to each other as possible. The exact same information. And in that way, we kind of made the test difficult for ourselves because the more similar you make them, the less likely you're going to find a difference between the two formats. But we really wanted to dial this down and have it be realistic. Like, uh, we don't want to make a difficult text. That, that's not what anyone would write anyway. We, we want to make it try as hard as possible for both formats to be understood. Here's the table format we ended up with. Um, you know, at the top we have a thousand older adults who uh, got placebo and then on the right we have a thousand older adults who got uh, older adults who got influenza vaccine. And then you have benefits and harms of those two groups and you can compare across them. So for example, is it effective at all? The top row is uh, how many older adults develop confirmed influenza. And in the placebo group, you know, it's two to three times higher. So it looks like, okay, there's something here. And then this is the uh, exact same information, but given in text format. Uh, and it's, for, it's not for the influenza one that I've just shown you, it's for the other condition, because uh, we actually investigated two versions uh, of this study in two different domains. We essentially ran two studies that, in parallel, one that was about um, influenza in older adults, and one that was about uh, antibiotics for ear infection in children. And in each case, there was a table versus um, text. And people only did one of the studies. OK. Because we've been uh, exhorting people to do studies on objective comprehension, you have to then develop a test, essentially like in education, asking people what they understood from the information. And we decided that it was more important that they could extract the information than that they could remember it without it being there. So we showed them these questions with the presentations you just saw. They could scroll back up and say, oh, yeah, well, how many in this group, that group, you know. 
that sort of thing. And some of these questions were about locating numbers, some were about the overall, you know, did it work or not? And then some of them um, were, were more general. The hardest questions were calculations. So, you know, out of 100 children who received the placebo, how many had issues with hearing? Almost a quarter, something like that. We had a large and expensive sample for the study because it was well funded. So these are census matched UK residents so that we can generalize to the general population. And we also asked them to uh, give us feedback in open response. And there were some very interesting pieces of feedback. So we were glad that we did that. Not just the closed questions of bubbles, but also they typed some things. And in particular, a common theme was people said the sample was too small to make those conclusions. And that's fascinating because if you go back and you look at our presentations, this says a thousand older adults with placebo and a thousand older adults with uh, influenza, but it's not a thousand adults actually. This is the, we, the studies are much larger than this and it's from a meta-analysis, but the problem was we didn't show people where the source was from. We didn't explain that this was a compilation of evidence, you know, Cochrane evidence reviews. And then, I told you earlier, you need to make the denominator the same so that you can compare across a thousand here, a thousand there. But it's not clear to the participants that this is a communication device, not how many people there were in each study. That's exactly the sort of thing you find out when you're testing that you didn't know otherwise and the mistake we made. Okay. Uh, some people had stress with the difficulty of the questions. Uh, look And look at this bottom one. It says, Lots of people take antibiotics when there's no need to. If info was given like this, it would really make it easier for people to decide whether or not antibiotics are really needed. And they're saying that because the evidence that we presented from the, from the Cochrane and other meta-analyses is pretty equivocal. It's, it's not great. Uh, I mean, you, you should make a decision, a personal decision, basically. And so statements like this is, it, we're, we're delight to see. That's exactly what people should be doing getting the info they need and then being able to make their own decision based on their own values. So we made some mistakes. We didn't include the source. Um, we thought we were going to do a one month follow-up, but then we had some difficulty. So we ended up doing a six week follow-up. We, that is, we showed um, them the information and then six weeks later we gave them another test to see if they could remember any of it. And we changed some of our analytic strategy after we realized uh, at the end that it didn't really make sense. You can get around these sort of analytic problems if you simulate your data in advance and then try and run all your stats. Because then if you go to run a command and you're like, wait, I can't do a t-test between the, like that doesn't, you'll know that up, up front before you make your plan. But we didn't do a simulation, so we made a couple mistakes there. There were some amusing pieces of feedback. Uh, let's see here. How about this one in the middle? I am blind. I rely on a narrator to read all text on the screen. <laughs> This is, this is funny because we showed our, uh, you know, our key stuff to them in images. Both the table, uh, all the tables were shown in images. So if they were in the table format, they just wouldn't have got any of the critical information of the study. <laughs> sort of thing you would never realize uh, you know, if they just clicked through the bubbles. How about this one? It's too much to read. I did not read a single sentence. All of my answers are irrelevant. But Broadly speaking, out of 2,000 people, most people are taking it seriously. So here's the key results uh, for some different outcomes. We have comprehension. We have did they decide to get the treatment or not? And, and I want to say about the treatment decision, there's not a right answer, especially when you have kind of equivocal treatments like these two. Um, there's not a right answer, but it would be useful to know whether a certain kind of format led people to a dramatically different decision. And, um, and some, some of their ratings of the information, do they feel informed, were they engaged? It's easier to see this information in uh, graph form, so I'll show you here. Excuse me. This is comprehension of the different formats, and we have the um, influenza in text message up top, and then the influenza fact box message and then the ear text and ear fact box. And you can see that both of the fact box conditions are a little bit higher comprehension than, uh, than the text. 
here's the trust in the different ones, and they look fairly similar. We also did an objective measurement of numeracy by giving them a difficult series of questions, like think, um, think sort of a SAT math kinds of questions to see whether they're good at numbers. And here you see on the y-axis the levels of numeracy. So one is the worst and four is the best. And now we're looking on the x-axis at how much they comprehended the message. And we see that numeracy two, three, and four have pretty similar comprehension. Four is a little bit better. And then uh, people with the worst numeracy have, uh, have not as good comprehension. There's two potential reasons for that pattern. One is the sort of, uh, as theory would suggest, people that are not as good at numbers in one domain won't be as good in another. But there's another thing that one should consider with giving people difficult tasks online and paying them not very much is that um, the same people who probably just drifted through like click, 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 like not caring very much are gonna do bad on both of these tasks as well. Well, we can look at that in another way. We can look at their level of um, education achieved and we see a similar pattern and so this, lends a little bit more credence because um, these people are presumably not referring to their education level um, in a lazy way, like they would maybe skip some math questions or not try that hard. People who um, had less education understood the information less, um, but not that, not that much less. You might ask yourself, well, is the fact box relatively more effective for different levels of education? And that's what's shown here. And actually, it looks helpful across all levels, which was a great surprise to us. Um, a, clean, a clean response. And the, uh, these two graphs show the same thing. You're just reversing what's in the legend. Some people prefer to see them in one format versus another. And here's those same sort of results, but for numeracy levels, is the fact box better than text even for people who don't, who aren't very comfortable with numbers? Uh, and the answer is yes. Tables are better than text even for people of low number of ability and low education. So that's great. This is important because sometimes uh, you can summarize information in a way that helps the overall population but might make it harder for vulnerable groups. And that's worth testing. Okay, so it worked. We have a effect size here of uh, Cohen's D 0.4, and that's pretty big for psychology, so uh, large here. Uh, we have some ceiling effects on comprehension. The test is maybe not quite hard enough, but we didn't, we, we didn't want it to be that hard. We wanted it to be realistic, something that they might actually need to know in a doctor's office to make a decision. And, uh, and the last point here, the ease of the registered report, just that it is a great format. I really enjoyed running the study in this format because we submitted the entire methods to the journal, um, you know, before we even ran the study, the journal reviewed it, we got reviews back and they said, you know, how about you change the design in this way, that way? And we thought, yeah, that's great. Thanks very much for the feedback, we'll do that. Then they said, great, and we accept your paper for publication, go run it. And then it was regardless of the results they were gonna publish it, which is exactly how science should be. I can't control the results. I can only control how good the methods are. And that conversation with the peer reviewers, you know, it was so collaborative. They were there to help. They weren't trying to just to knock down the study because we hadn't done it yet. So they were helping us craft it into a stronger form. Really nice experience. Less stressful to analyze the results because it didn't matter if it was significant. I want to thank all of my students and collaborators who uh, helped with all of this work. And, uh, and thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions uh, uh, now or by email.